Okay. Okay. First, I'm gonna get my cheat sheet out. It's all right, everyone. Find a buddy. Punched card. Your cheat sheet's on paper. Okay. In here, of course, we've got the early abacus machines that everyone understands. But it's important to us that people actually sat down and were extremely skilled. And of course, you see the guys on TVs that can beat calculators with abacuses. So, you know, that that's always been a part of this museum. It's not one of the things I'm talking personally about today. <laughs> well, some of these machines predate my own time zone. But when I started learning how to program, I sat down on a key punch just like this. You type your data in, a card would go through and punch holes. The data is in the holes. It's a computer concept, not a human concept. Human concepts are you write words. Um, as you walked in the entry to this building, you actually walked over a floor that had punch card layouts. And they, are, they actually um, have meaningful information. I don't know what it is, but you can ask somebody. One of the, the little stories of interest that I pride myself on is at Berkeley, when I was taking programming courses, around finals time, you had to wait 40 minutes to get on one of these key punches to get your turn to punch a change in your program. You'd have to wait 40 minutes. Oh my gosh, it would be midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Well, I found over on the side, they had a couple of other key punches. Most people were using the Model 19. And I used the Model 26. Nobody else used the Model 26 because it was for a different computer. But I discovered that if you touch type, all these special characters like the a left parentheses might be hold your left pinky down and use your, pink, your middle finger and hit up near the E key at the same time. You'd even use the same hand for two button presses, but I knew how to do it on the key punches so well, I discovered it punched the same holes even though it printed the wrong characters. So I'd go to these unused machines, not having to wait 40 minutes, I'd punch out my programs this way and it would read wrong on the text, but the holes were right and the computer only knows holes. And that's what matters. Um, this is a very, very simple ancient contraption, yet it's where I actually started with computers. The simplest computer logic circuit is a light switch. You turn it on, the light goes on. You turn it off. Very similar to that are these devices down here called relays. You're not seeing very many real electronic parts. You're basically seeing batteries, relays, and a couple lights. And this was an adder that could add one and zero, and it would get a one. Or it could add a zero and a one and get a one. Or it could add a zero and a zero and get a zero. Or it could add a one and a one and it would get a zero and a carry. Take that and you multiply it, put it side by side ten times, you can add and subtract numbers up to a thousand. And that's basically the heart of computers. This was before vacuum tubes, before transistors, before chips. So way back in time, people were starting to play around with how could we make circuits do a little bit of work for us. Steve's going to talk about a machine over here that I sadly did not unwrap. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now, when I was in high school, I accidentally stumbled upon a manual. It describes the architecture of the PDP-8 over there. It was a manual called the Small Computer Handbook. And I opened it up, and it described really how a real computer that was made and sold worked. It's the first time in my life I discovered such a thing, and really inspired me to say, Wow, I wonder if I could teach myself how to design these things. There were no books, nothing on computers. So what I did was I found a way to get the manuals for all the mini computers when there were no stores that sold such things. What I would do is go to Stanford Linear Accelerator Center on Sundays with a friend, and we'd drive in thinking nobody's there. And the smart, smart people that work there, they always leave doors unlocked. So we'd always get into the, the main building had a library, and I'd go to the library and read mag computer magazines that you could never find in normal magazine stores, and there were little cards you could fill out and order the manuals for almost all the mini computers you see here. I would order their manuals. When they came home, I'd go in my little room at home, shut the door, nobody knew I did this. No friends, no parents, no teachers, and I would just start to design with chips, the chips that were available in those days, how many chips could I make this computer in? Try to get better and better and better. Just um, uh, competed with myself. One of the big steps in my life was my first transistor radio. First time ever I held a gadget in my hand that I loved what it could do. It brought me music. It opened my world up. I could sleep with it and hear music all night long and uh, music's become such a big part of my life. And I looked at my little radio and it had six transistors in it. Hand built in Japan, but hand built. And um, my dad 
worked at Lockheed. The only people that could afford the early chips and really spur this chip industry was the military and the very largest corporations, their needs for computers. So my dad had access to the companies in Silicon Valley that were about to make the first chips ever. And he took me to a show when I was maybe eight years old and, and I went there and I saw a gentleman presented a, a picture that showed little blocks and said, this is a picture that we're gonna turn into a chip with six transistors on one chip, one piece of silicon. And I went home and I went to my dad and I said, wow, so they're going to make better transistor radios? And he said, no, 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 these chips cost way too much. Only the military can afford them. After a number of years, there's surplus that they don't need anymore, and that's what people get. And I always felt darn, you know, the needs of real people for things in their home that bring them enjoyment should be pushing our industry. Well, what is pushing the state of the art of the silicon industry nowadays? Personal computers and now games. The highest, most powerful chips that are made on Earth are, are made for game machines, so the legacy of the little personal device has come true. I used to go to Stanford Artificial Intelligence Center where I had a friend that worked, and I would see some robots doing different tasks, being trained to pick out cubes of a certain shape or whatever, and just mesmerized me, you know, and I yeah. thought, wow, computers, this is like artificial intelligence. Well, it was kind of a low level of it, but... Uh, all, you know, we keep asking, are we going to build robots that are all of a sudden smarter than us and they take over? Well, we always have this idea we can turn them off. Well, today's biggest robot, the biggest example of intelligence we have is the Internet. You used to ask a smart person a question. Now who do you ask? It starts with G-O and it's not God. <laughs> and so, so you ask a question, you get back all these incredible answers. You know, usually, usually you get better answers and quicker and get what you want than asking a human being. And so the part of the brain has now become, come about, and the internet was not designed to be that part of a brain. The internet was just, you know, designed to be connections between people and the searches, and because of its magnitude, it has maybe an order number of magnitudes, an order of magnitude, the number of nodes that we have neurons in the brain, all of a sudden it turns out to sort of be an intelligence. Well, can you put that computer aside? If you think about these early computers we saw that they made very few of that cost, you know, billions of today's dollars, um, for the military, those were very important steps to them, and all of a sudden, we've lost a lot of control. We can't turn off our internet, we can't turn off our smartphones, we can't turn off our computer. How would we live a life without any of those things, you know, for the next six months or something? Um, how would we, you know, cars without computers? So all of a sudden, technology, we've just built it in to help us, but we're dependent on it. And eventually, we're going to have it doing every task we can in the world, so we can sit back and relax, but now we're not needed as much as the technology. So who's the master and who's the slave, I always think. But it's not like we design. <laughs> well, this is a very important exhibit because the biggest changes in computers throughout time are usually in the areas of input and output, the devices that really connect it to the, to the human being. Mm -hmm. um, did we pass up, Chris, the, um, where the Homebrew Computer Club? Should? No, that's okay. actually here. Very quickly, this is Pong. This is the Pong prototype designed by Al Alcorn, who loaned to us for this wonderful exhibit. Um, probably the game most responsible for the explosion of arcades of the 1970s. Um, also the most pirated computer game ever. Uh, for, I think, for every official Pong Atari sold, there were about 15 Pongs that were unauthorized that were sold all around the world. This was built by wiring wires between chips that signals went up and down, up and down, no programming. You didn't tell it a sequence of steps to follow. You had to program it to actually wind up putting white and black dots on the screen at certain places. You had to actually design it that way, and it was very difficult in those days. I mean, it would take maybe a half a band year at least to design a machine like this, and a program, it's maybe half a day. One when of did, the early courses in Introduction to Computers in college, you learn how to program things When like did you Pong. start working at Atari? Was it I, didn't, I didn't work at Atari, but I saw Pong in a bowling alley. I went home and said, oh my god, I have to have this. And my way was, I, I'm a good designer. I designed my own 28 little $1 chips on a board. I had Pong playing on my TV set at home. Snaked the cable in, figured out how to do it. And um, I, eventually Steve Jobs came back and he took my game down to Atari and he got a job. Atari was in Los Gatos, California, where I live now. Very proud of that. So I used to go in and visit at night. They had Steve working at night so he wouldn't be around other people. <laughs> it's been bad. It's been bad. And uh, then he got us a job. I designed the first breakout game for Atari. Yeah. So I didn't really work there. They tried to hire me, but I said, never leave Hewlett Packard. I love my company. I'm loyal. Yeah. You built that in one weekend, didn't you? Um, breakout, four days. Four, four days. days and nights. 
it was a half man year job. I didn't think I could do it. And we stayed up all night, all day, all night long. We both got the sleeping sickness mononucleosis. Steve Jobs and I both got it doing that project. Delivered a working breakout game. And uh, it was one of the, the highlights of my life because I love games. I love things that young people do, that children do. It related to my interest in education. And um, also, again, had a big impact in how I designed those game-like features into the early Apple computers, especially the Apple II, because games were going to come into computers. Game equipment, like knobs and paddles and buttons and sounds, were going to be an important part of computers. And I hope I had a little, um, a little uh, part in history in accelerating that. And then the computer gaming, as games became software, they took off to what we have today. Okay, um, at our Homebrew Computer Club, there were a lot of people that were low level, not executives in companies, 500 people every two weeks would meet in an auditorium and they all wanted to talk about the social revolution. We wanted to feel that we were leaders of something. We were the spirit. The big computer companies didn't realize that a computer in the home, a computer in your own possession, was going to be so valuable, worth so much, so meaningful and uh, emotional. So they started saving their money, and only a few of the people in the club, even after half a year, were able to afford their own little machines that were sold as kits of parts. You got a kit of parts and some instructions, and you started bolting it together, soldering things like I did to my ham radio in sixth grade, and uh, you'd wind up with a little working device. You could toggle switches up and down, ones and zeros. You could push buttons, and those ones and zeros would go into a little area called memory. And um, it was very important. Now, what we talked about these machines would be used for, they were going to empower people. We, were going to, we young people that knew how to program the computers were going to become masters within our companies. We'd go into our company, put a computer on our desk, type in the company's financial data, and come out with the, the output as to what the company should do next, how it should use its money, and we were going to beat their million dollar computers and the, their high paid programmers just on our own. We were going to be able to type messages into one computer, and 100 people would read it an hour later and we could communicate in ways that had never been imagined before. Young children were going to be given problems to solve and their solutions would be judged and they would be told if it was right or wrong and their brains were going to be accelerated ten times more than normal brains. And we had all these great ideas that inspired us. And I said, I have technical skills and I want to donate my technical skills to this effort. So I built an Apple One computer um, by hand, all myself, all the hardware, did all the software. Bill Gates had written a basic. I said, basic, you need basic on a computer to make it really usable. So I wrote my own basic. You need enough memory. So I used the right type of memory that was affordable. And the Apple I was not exactly completely built like a hi-fi. You pull it out of the box and use it. But it totally gave away the formula that you should type on a small keyboard that's not here, a human keyboard like a typewriter, and see your answer on a video display that that was the way to make a computer affordable. And other computers that we passed already followed in that model once they saw it. Now, I didn't design this computer to make a lot of money to start a company. I wanted to accelerate the world's advancement in this social revolution that it would cause, so I gave away my designs for free. I passed them out on Xerox sheets and gave them out to everybody at the club that wanted them and said, look, it's so easy, you can build your own. But eventually Steve Jobs came and said, why don't we build it for them and start a company called Apple and after Hewlett Packard turned me down five times on the idea. This device, the Apple One computer, was done very quick in a very quick time, just a few months. But the key to it was I already had a device, I had most of it already designed and built and working so I could talk to computers across the country. The early inspiration for today's internet was the ARPANET. It was an inspiration that gave us the ideas of connecting faraway computers together and I liked being at home and I could type on a little keyboard and on my, com my TV screen that wasn't playing Pong anymore, I could see a list of computers across the country and I could log on to MIT and then it would have things I could log in as a guest and I could log run some programs that were available to guests and it was an amazing experience. I just said, why don't I put the computer, a microprocessor chip, these microprocessor chips were new. We didn't have very many transistors in those days and why don't I put a little program that when you start up, it watches for you to type things like our calculators at Hewlett Packard. And that was really, um, really the formula to make a computer more like a calculator. Something a human being turns on and starts to use right away without having to go through the steps of building it, understanding the technology, knowing about even ones and zeros. 
And uh, the Apple II was really more a more thorough job of a beautiful computer, but this one wasn't designed to be a computer. It was designed to be a terminal, to talk to a computer in Boston, and I modified it to be a computer, and that was the Apple I. And I look at, if anyone looked down in those days and saw this few of chips, they were on a much smaller board, they would say, that's all you need to be able to type a computer program in and run a computer game. It would really be an amazing experience. So we're here at the Apple II exhibit, or the personal computer exhibit, which is almost like the end of the history of the, of the revolutions. Well, uh, actually, the first, actually, the personal computer, we're talking 1975 was 37 years ago. Yeah. So it's, it's still a ways in the past, but it sort of set the tone that integrated circuits, chips, had the technology, and because of Moore's Law and getting less expensive, from that point on, once we had these personal computers, we were going to wind up with devices sort of like what we have today. Perfect. So it feels like, yeah, it feels like, and not only that, the people that are alive enjoying their technologies today, so many of them, this was such a the hugest selling computer at the time, the first one that really got a lot of the people that run the companies tell me, they used to program their Apple II, and that's how they learned about computers. They went through all the notes and read the software listings. So that's why the Apple II it still seems like it's today. Yeah. Because the people who are doing stuff today did have it when they were young and loved it. And it's that sort of love that Apple has constantly managed to keep in its products. Yeah. You know, that somehow it becomes more than just a device. I still remember the day we unboxed ours at home in 77 and also uh, got some at High Junior High. I was in the first computer <laughs> High Junior computer yeah. in Cupertino, mm -hmm. which was close to Apple. And uh, we got a couple of them. And, uh, Loaded up the tape drive and pushed play and started, you know, playing some games and loading some programs. Great times really to remember back to. <laughs> uh, I think it was a green screen, right? It was, yeah. Uh, now the very first Apple One ever made, you know, I gave it to um, uh, a, a woman who took it up to schools, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, showed them how computers work. Liza Loa was her name, and I had to buy it for three hundred bucks. <laughs> she wouldn't let me have it for free. <laughs> the businessman. But um, that was the first one ever, and, and then when schools came about, you know, Steve and I donated the first Apple II. That was a real donation to Homestead High School, where we went. Yeah, and you, you donated some to my school at West Valley Community, Community College, and that's sort of yes, how I, I got was, my start in, in the computer business. Yes, I was so glad to hear about, you know, when somebody wanted to use technology the right way. Yeah. I remember my, my mom worked for Hildy Lit, who worked for Apple, building the motherboards at home, and I remember soldering the, mo the motherboards and making allowance, getting allowance for, for wow. making the motherboards, and I always... That was, that was a really important point in time. People don't realize that, I mean, we didn't offshore manufacturing. We actually took our, yeah, we took the boards and we sent them to Hildy, and she had her group of housewives or whatever that wanted to earn extra money, and they'd sit down there and put the chips in and do the soldering, and we'd go and pick them up. It was an unbelievable time in Silicon Valley. For not that many decades ago, but I know Hildy was very, very important to us. Hildy and Harley lived. Um, yes, and I haven't kept up with them like I should. We used to uh, uh, wash the motherboards in our dishwasher and wash the solder flux off of the motherboards and then uh, send them back to Hildy. Oh, I remember those days very well because I would go down to, to the house there with Hildy and we'd get them back and hear those stories. Yeah. That's <laughs> pretty crazy. But I remember looking at the motherboard and, and thinking, that this is so beautiful. And I always wanted to meet the guy who designed it. You know, I didn't, I didn't actually design the motherboard. I designed the circuitry. Um, who did I, I did. I did design the board for the uh, disc floppy disk, though. Okay. I did, laid that one out myself. Um, for the Apple One, we had a friend at Atari who paid him, and he did all the manual hooking up. For the Apple Two, we actually had a computer design, to, 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 and we just paid somebody, a friend, to sit down and do it. it wasn't anybody close to Apple? It was Very just hire people, a person that does it. This was probably the, the last computer designed by uh, a single human being. Right? After that, computers were done by teams. Who some yeah. some teams did the processor, some teams did the uh, the architecture and stuff like that. Right? And it's almost the only. And it was such a strange point in time, a little window, because before that, the machinery, the the hardware was so huge and heavy, and it took many people, teams of many types of engineers, to build them. It was a little point in history where almost one person with one set of computer talents could do the whole job, but it's just odd that I did even the hardware, I did the software as well, did all the testing, the layout, the technician work, nothing touched any other hands. But you know what? You do that when it's the only way you can have something you want. I mean, well, you we should. Yourself, people would go into a garage and they would work on milling machines 
for, for weeks or months or whatever to build some little piece of equipment that they would have special for themselves that they couldn't afford. Well, we're here in the new revolution. We got a sneak preview with you, a tour with you, walking us around. And this is like it's almost the end of the exhibit. This is off the, yes. near the end of it. Tell me a little bit about some of the computers that led up to the development of this, because I, I thought that was fascinating. It, your life really is sure. reflected through much of the exhibits here. Yeah. Well, I, when I was very young, I stumbled into computer technology and I started designing computers on paper for myself over and over and over. Every And the mini computers <coughs> were really the heart of it. Once I learned that, my gosh, I can figure out how to design a mini computer. And then I can learn how I can design it again better. I can design it again better, fewer and fewer parts. I knew that I was going to have a computer of my own someday. And somewhere along the road when I met Steve Jobs, it was right when I had designed the computer, an executive got some parts given to me, and I built a computer of my own. And then five years later, the homebrew computer started, and the machines came out like that, um, the Altair and the Insight. They had the same characteristics as the one I built five years before. Well, you never go back to where you were. You always go forward. And I knew that what I wanted wasn't a machine that twiddled lights and switches and worked internally like a computer. What I wanted was something I could write my programs for. Like, I was an engineer at Hewlett Packard. I wanted to write my engineering programs in programming language. Or I wanted, I wanted to write games. I wanted to play games on a machine. That was so important to me after my Atari video game experience. So um, I, I really saw the formula was we had to use the dynamic RAMs. Everybody else was trying to use static RAMs. But it was never going to be affordable to run a program that way. It was, it was easier for the designers. But it's like the designers in the early kit computers weren't true engineers. They weren't high-level engineers. To design something like refreshing these dynamic memories takes an extra step and some thought and some parts and it's not as easy, not trivial. The parts they used for RAMs, you just wire it up according to a sheet you're looking at somebody else design. You don't design the computer. You really look at somebody else's design and just wire it up. So um, I took the step to say this is the only way to make it affordable. The television as the output device was key but I'd already discovered that by trying to build games, and video games like Pong that I wanted. So the first is right behind So it. really, I didn't have to say, how do you build a computer? It's like my little step, step by step by step by step, led me straight to it. And the Apple One, I already had a terminal I could type into to a far away computer. So the Apple One was just put the computer on the board. Now the Apple Two, I said, whoa, now I see the formula. I'm going to design a computer from ground up, but I'm going to design it for games. And I put color in it. And I didn't know if it would work because I had a clever idea. So a lot of patentable ideas. And then Steve Jobs and I, you know, shuddered and we knew when you can type a number on a keyboard and a blue square pops up on a TV screen, yeah. you type another number and a yellow square pops up. You look at each other and you instantly know that by manipulating numbers, you can all of a sudden have all the graphics of the world, you know, right up to Pixar. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah, we knew that. We knew that. That was a Eureka moment. So we knew this machine was gonna be hot and we weren't going to give it away. Yeah. Well, we could spend hours just talking with you about games, because you have the world's high score in Tetris, I think <laughs> I remember right. And yeah. You've always been in, interested in the On the game one. On the game. On the game one. And the Apple II certainly was, you know, changed my life in terms of games. I, I remember playing Choplifter in high school and all sorts of different mm -hmm. games. And our computer club used to trade games. And, and you know, mm -hmm. my dad used to buy them and bring them to the library and we'd trade yep. them. One of the biggest importance of the Apple IIs was it said a computer that can do work can also be fun. I am so proud of that because I built deliberately game paddle circuits in there. You know, very simple. It didn't take a lot of parts and a lot of cost. And I built the color on the screen. It was all set for games. So all of a sudden, the world started learning how to make things seem to move and how to make them seem to move smoothly, how to make them look more detailed and more closer and closer and closer to what we have today where it looks like you're playing on a movie. But um, it was great to see the evolution of games on computers, and it started with the Apple II. Okay. That was the computer that said games will now be programmable by anyone. A fifth grader who knows basic can sit down like I did and write breakout in basic. Why, why did Apple happen in Silicon Valley? Why, why didn't it happen in Albuquerque or Seattle or New York or Boston? Because there, there were certainly because computer we geeks. You lived here. <laughs> <laughs> we lived here. Now, of course, if we lived somewhere else, we probably still would have done it. I would have probably designed this and uh, maybe Steve Jobs would have gotten me the parts or something and we probably would have, when we got funded, 
the funding might have let us be in another city. Back then, it wasn't so important that when you got venture capital, we had an angel who lived here, yeah. that you have to move to a certain city. Was that Mike Markola? Mike Markola, who's often ignored, but he was really a lot of the brains of how to organize a business. He saw Steve Jobs' potential, but Steve Jobs' role at first was largely to do almost any aspect of the company, any discipline in the company that needed attention to, to be in charge of learning how to be you know, a fair executive. And it takes decades to learn these things as well as to become a person that Steve Jobs is today. And Mike Markle knew what kinds of other people we had to hire, what their job responsibilities would be, how organizations were set up. So he was really the most person most responsible for the success of Apple in the early days, leading up to our IPO, but you never hear about it. You know, and, he, and actually, we gave him as much stock as Steve and I had, equal stock. Yeah. Well, I certainly remember the VCs, because they're really important people in the, in the valley. What's your favorite exhibit, other than the Apple stuff that you've been in, personally involved in? What, what's your favorite exhibit here in the, in the uh, Revolutions exhibit? I'm going to have to say, oh gosh, it could be the CDC 6600 um, computer, which I programmed at Berkeley and admired the architecture so much. But I think it's more the IBM 360 Model 40 that's here. It reminds me of one I used to sneak into a computer lab at the end, wrote so many programs and so many classes for that model computer, and I got the manual. There's a manual sitting by that computer here. And I went through that manual, and I, uh, all the manuals, I bought them all, and learned the architecture and how well it was thought out and designed, and I've read books on it since. I think that was a really major step for computing. You know, one computer that's not in this exhibit but is in the Computer History Museum is the IBM 1401. The IBM 1401 sold for roughly 25 million of today's dollars. They sold 30,000 of them. You do the multiplication. That made IBM a big force in the world. Very cool. Thank you so much for giving me a tour, and uh, it's really great to spend some time talking about the Apple. Good. Good to talk to you, Robert.